How does the internet work? Well, this story begins, as most great stories do, with pirates. Yarg. In 2007, pirates, yes, real life, actual pirates, stole seven miles worth of a metal cable that was lying at the bottom of the ocean. They had heard that this cable was metal and just laying down there, so they found it, chopped off a few miles of it, stole it, and tried to sell it for scrap metal. But when they did this, the moment they chopped that cable, they screwed up the internet service for all of Vietnam. So, if you were hanging out in a cafe in Hanoi at the time, trying to get on the Wi-Fi, it all of a sudden got very, very slow, and it might have stopped working altogether. Why? Pirates. Wait, what? Now, this story so far should make absolutely no sense to you. And that's fine. In this lecture and the ones that follow, I'm going to teach you exactly how the internet works. And after you understand that, you'll get why pirates can screw it up for the Vietnamese. And before we move on with the story, I should mention, you're currently watching lecture number one in section number one of a new online course called Before You Start Coding key concepts for aspiring engineers. The lectures in this first section are all about how the internet works. Section two is all about how websites, servers, and browsers work. Section three is about how computers themselves work. Section four is how programming is done, the process and the tools that are used. And section five tells you what a career as a modern software engineer is really like. And I'm going to cover all these topics just like this, by telling stories. This isn't a coding tutorial. These are key concepts you need to understand before you start coding. Anyway, let's get back to the pirates. Yeah. The pirates cut and stole what is known as a submarine communications cable. That is, a communications cable, just like you might see in a telephone pole, that is buried in the sea floor and stretches all the way across some body of water. There are many of these cables, and they connect every continent to each other, except Antarctica. Everywhere else has been interconnected by the cables for almost 150 years. Why? Because back in the late 1800s, they didn't have the internet, but they did have the telegraph. And for people on one continent to send telegrams to someone on another continent, they had to lay down these wires in the ocean. And if you can't picture what a telegraph is, just think of any movie where you've seen someone listening to and deciphering Morse code. That's a telegraph. And Morse code was only one of the ways that they could work. But anyway, the telegraph companies laid all these wires, and then as telecommunications technology improved over the years, those wires got upgraded and revamped and expanded. But the same principle applies. These wires let continents talk to each other. These days, one of the things submarine cables carry is internet data. The cable that the pirates cut was owned by VTI, Vietnam Telecom International, and it connected Thailand, Vietnam, and Hong Kong. There were other cables that did this as well, and so internet traffic could still continue at a slower pace, but until they fixed it, internet for many Vietnamese was noticeably slower. You see, that cable is part of what is known as the internet backbone, the physical infrastructure and data routes that make the internet possible. There are four key parts of the internet backbone. One, the wires and wireless routes that allow information to flow around the world. Two, internet exchange points. Three, networks called tier one and tier two networks. And four, internet service providers. You, as you're probably well aware, connect to the internet through the last one internet service providers. In order to understand what they are and what all the other things I just listed are, I need you to put on your platform shoes and bell bottoms because we need to go back to the 1970s. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, there was no single global internet or World Wide Web, but there were two little budding internets that were each growing rapidly. You see, if you take 
two computers and link them together with some kind of wire and program them to send messages back and forth on that wire, you've created a local network or intranet. Now, if you link that intranet with another intranet, often by using devices called routers, you've created an internet, a system of interconnected networks. And in the early 1970s, there were two internets of note. That is, there was one collection of computers in England called the NPL network for National Physical Laboratory, and another collection of interconnected networks in the US called ARPANET, which was ran by DARPA, part of the Department of Defense. In 1973, these two networks were connected with each other through a link in Norway, creating the first semblance of the World Wide Web that we know today. Another major milestone happened a decade later in 1986, because I was born that year. Just kidding. The real 1986 milestone was that six new networks got added to the existing infrastructure under a program called NSFNet. Six turned into 13, which turned into hundreds. And by 1990, these growing number of small interconnected networks came to be known by everyone as the internet. By then, the routing technology had matured and standardized, and the networks had agreed on a set of communication protocols so their computers could all understand each other. This collection of protocols came to be known as the Internet Protocol Suite, or the TCP IP Suite. We'll get into the details of routing and TCP IP later. For now, all you need to know is that these early networks grew and grew. Routers got bigger and more advanced, and more and more networks and people started coming online. That is, connecting to everyone else who was already connected to everyone else. And that, in a nutshell, is what the internet is. Wires, and these days now wireless and satellite signals, connecting everyone to everyone else. Today, the internet exchange points that I mentioned earlier are buildings full of giant routers called core routers. Very, very expensive machines that make sure the information I'm sending to you goes to you, and the information you're sending to Facebook goes to them, etc., etc. Tier 1 and Tier 2 networks are just collections of large communications companies who own a ton of cables and other routing infrastructure that they have laid down all over the world, and they use internet exchange points and other services to make sure that everyone connected to their network can access and be accessed by everyone connected to all the other networks. Internet service providers are often members of Tier 1 and Tier 2 networks. We all know ISPs. They're the companies who come to your apartment seven hours later than they promised, put a hole in your wall or a satellite dish on your roof, and let you connect to the interconnected maze of networks. These days, fiber optic cable has taken much of the place of metal wires wherever possible. Because fiber is literally just glass or plastic that lets beams of light travel through it at close to the speed of photons, whereas metal wires are slower because they send information at the speed of electrons. But in some places, Internet access is still provided by metal wires, or by satellites, or even by hot air balloons. And back in 2007, the way much of Vietnam connected to everyone else was through metal cables lying on the bottom of the ocean. Vietnam had local networks and ISPs, but the way their networks got access to the internet exchange points that could connect them to the rest of the world was through these submarine cables. So when pirates cut that, they cut off much of Vietnam from the internet and much of the rest of the world from Vietnam. So that, in a nutshell, is how the internet, or at least the internet backbone, works, and how pirates can screw up the internet for a whole country. In the next lectures and sections of this course, we're going to go deeper. I've got plenty of these stories from everything from IP addresses to domain names to DNS to email and more. And in future sections, we'll cover how computers work, how websites work, how programming is done, and beyond. If you get stuck along the way, there are two ways to get help. There's a student forum where you can post a public question and get answers from me or other students, but there's also direct messaging with me at any time. I always try my best to respond to Q&A questions and messages as quickly as possible. So just remember, you are not alone when taking this course. You're doing so with other students, and I'm right here to help you along the way whenever you need me.
If you're watching this, but you haven't enrolled in the course, I'm afraid your journey stops here. For everyone else, let's move on to the next part, because I have to tell you a story about giraffes, nuclear missiles, and Moore's Law.